Hello, this is a bit of a bonus video, specifically for my YouTube subscribers. Today, at the end of my devotional, I kind of dropped a bombshell. And uh, I was really surprised that I didn't get a lot of people's comments flooding me with private messages and comments on the post and uh, demanding to know why I make such a statement. Let me remind you what that statement was. That there is a difference between being dead in Christ and asleep in Christ. And if you'll bear with me, we will look this up. For the fun of it all. Dead in Christ is used one time in the New Testament. One time. And I would wager to say that there's not a minister, a preacher, who's preached and taught the Bible, studied the Bible to any extent, especially since... Somebody started the theory, and I won't say somebody, Darby wrote the theory of the rapture, which Schofield and Haley helped him to make popular, along with people like, ah, you know the guys, Falwell and uh, Jim Baker and uh, Swaggered and all the other groups that jumped on this, this theory. So, if you've been a study, student of the Bible, and you've at least been made familiar with the rapture theory, which, by the way, I have to be up front and tell you from the beginning, I think it, you know, it's a nice fairy tale. It's a nice story. It, If you want to believe it, you believe it. I don't care. It doesn't affect salvation one way or the other. It really has nothing to do with salvation. The whole purpose of of Paul and Peter and other apostles, including Jesus himself, for writing about that there would be a time that Christ would return for us and bring with him the kingdom of heaven is to comfort us and that we would take this knowledge and comfort one another with it. So if the rapture theology, theory, because that's all theology is, by the way, it's different people's denominational, doctrinal opinion of how certain things unfold. So if that theology tickles your innards, I don't care, believe it, I don't care. That I'm going to show you what the scripture actually teaches throughout my studies and I will point out when I think the scripture goes against the reasonable logic of the Bible and various reasons to why I think it's you know it may tickle your fancy I like a lot of the songs but the theory itself I think is is flawed in many ways with big enough Holes in it that you could drive two tractor trailer trucks side by side and probably a car pulling a big boat behind it as well side by side because you see there's a lot of things that just don't really make sense when you look at the scripture and you begin to put it together but there have been people who have spent a lot of money and a lifetime and have made a lot of money selling you their theory of end time. Now, I haven't forgot where we're at, but because I'm talking about end time, I'm, I'm going to put this out there. Well, for a moment, my COPD is letting me talk, and it seems like uh, the little bit of fever I've had is broken for a bit. So I want to I wanna do this now. But... There's a, a lady who for 
oh, the last six or seven months on TikTok has charts and papers and documents and scriptures being tossed up in the air. And she predicted, actually she didn't predict, she declared, she promised, she affirmed that the end of time was going to be on November. Uh, yeah, well, it didn't happen, did it? And she said at the very latest December, because it had to happen in 2023. Well, the Bible says, you know, a prophet, whether they be of God or not, by whether or not if their prophecy becomes true. Now, I told people when she was doing it, she was full of baloney. But... People were buying her baloney. She was getting tons of gifts from people giving her money. And, you know, made her feel, look important, like she was, you know, a scholar beyond scholars. Up until a few years ago, I don't agree with all the theology that comes from different preachers. But I at least had a lot of respect for one of them, and I won't call him by name. I'll just say, you'll know him. Big Assembly of God preacher, famous worldwide, one of the largest followings. And several years ago, he decided to be the wise in time teller. And uh, he based his predictions all on the blood moon. It was going to happen on the first blood moon. And when that didn't happen, well, I made a mistake. I didn't take into this consideration. So it's happening on the second blood moon. Second blood moon came. It didn't happen. Well, again, I made a small error. It's the third blood moon for sure. It didn't happen. Now, let me tell you what happens to me. I saw all the charts. I saw the charts on the, on the, his beliefs in tribulation and his beliefs of, I mean, some of these people have silly beliefs. They believe that the church is going to be raptured and be spared the tribulation. And afterwards, the tribulation would start. And then when the tribulation goes for seven years, that Jesus then would return and do another judgment. Wait a minute. How many times did the Bible say Christ will return? His first coming was when he came and was born of a virgin birth to Mary. Now you have him coming for a rapture, and then you have him coming again for what you like to call the great white throne judgment. But the scripture doesn't really teach that. You can twist it to make those stories. But that's what you're doing. And you're putting a lot of, of, of ideology that you have, that you develop, just like Darby did and Haley did and Schofield did and Falwell and Swaggart and the rest of them did to come up with this great rapture theory. I mean, does it really matter? Does it matter to me how you believe it's going to happen? Because... The ideal isn't that I'm going to wait until I look up in the sky and see the Lord returning, and then I'm going to suddenly repent of my sins. It doesn't work that way. It won't work that way. Jesus said, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. I wouldn't be counting on deathbed repentance if I was you. There's a lot of problems with that theology as well. So then... We are to come to the Lord and prepare our heart and our life and grow in the Lord to start out as a seed and grow into a sapling, then into a tree, then into a tree that produces what? 
good fruit. The mature tree, the mature Christian, the sanctified, holy Christian that produces good fruit. We talk a lot about sanctification in our devotionals. It comes up from time to time. And I remind you over and over again, that means to be set aside holy. To be set aside. That's what sanctified means, to be set aside holy. So sanctification is the process of being set aside holy. And that is a learning process. You have to get into the race. See, for Paul said, we all run in a race, but only one receives the prize. You, you don't get in the race and then stop midway and take a break and expect to win the prize. If you do, you're like the story Jesus told us of the of the rich man who was prospering greatly and he looked around and he said, "Wow, I've got I've got more grain, more su surplus than my barns are hold. Let me tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to take my ease and I'm going to eat, drink and be merry." And the Bible says that It was said unto him, Thou fool, this day thy soul shall be required of thee. And now, to get back to the subject at hand, because I do want you to ponder. I'm not, by the way, in my Bible studies, in my devotionals, I don't want you to think that I don't expect you to research and study and ask questions and look at where I'm coming from and how I'm putting the scripture together and how it works in a logical sense in my head through the leading by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or I wouldn't preach it or I wouldn't teach it. And when it's something that I don't have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then I simply tell you it's my opinion. And opinions are like noses. We all have one. So, and even what I feel led by the Holy Spirit, every preacher that's ever got behind a pulpit tells you I am led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave me this word and I'm speaking it to you. Well, sometimes people get mixed up. Is it the Holy Spirit or is it their religious theology classes they took in their particular version of denominational Bible school? Or is it outright the devil giving it to them? Because I'll tell you, if it goes contrary to God's word, then it isn't coming from God. And that means it's not coming from the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm still going to get to my point, folks. But to get there, those of you who follow me and you know this about me, it's hard for me to do these 10-minute devotionals every day because I'm the guy, if we're going to walk to the stream, we're going to take the wooded scenic path and we're going to look at the trees and the flowers along the way. We're going to set down on the stump and determine whether it's a pine or an oak stump or uh, some other version of tree, an elm or whatever. We're going to dig into this word of God to get us to the stream. It's just how I am. A few years ago, I say a few years ago, now I want you to understand I'm going into 55 years of ministry. I was licensed to preach in 1969, but I actually started preaching in 1968. Preached, got approved by the church, brought up before the presbytery for license in 1969, 
and was ordained in 1970. So I've been at this a long time. And boy, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. Sure I have. And I get to, just like you, I'll hear somebody bring up something and it, wow, that sounds, that, boy, that sounds really good. And then I go back to my Bible and I try to find it because I'm, I made a note of what they said because I wanted, to, I wanted to research it. And I thought, this God will let me use in an upcoming message. And gee, I couldn't find it. One of my favorite examples of that, a, a pastor in his later years, but a minister at the time and a good friend of mine who came to our church, I'd asked him to preach one Sunday. And he did a fine job preaching. He did. Don't ever think that by the, this example I'm taking away from his sermon because his sermon was wonderful. A lot of people can preach a wonderful sermon and sometimes just because we have learned something the wrong way, we heard it from a source we trusted and we didn't look it up. We make mistakes. I'm guilty. And I'm sure everybody else is guilty. But I try to learn from my mistakes and I try to correct my mistakes when I make them. And when I'm just speaking at I mean, this isn't the voice of the Holy Spirit. This is my voice. This is my brain working, taking in what God has taught me over the years and giving it out, inspired by the Holy, Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's not the one speaking. I'm speaking. When I get to speaking something the Holy Spirit says to me, it's like being whopped right upside the face. So let me go back to my example real quick. Young young preacher uh, preaching I say young he's just a couple of years shyer than I am and we lost him during COVID two years ago and it broke my heart because I love the man greatly but he as he was preaching he quoted as if it was Bible he said the Bible tells us that your sins are forgiven from the east to the west and they are cast away and remembered no more when you come to the altar. I thought, wow. And all the times I've read through the Bible, studied through the Bible verse by verse, I don't remember having ever come across that particular verse of Scripture. So, as everyone had left the church, and he and I was talking, and I said to him, I said, can you show me where you got that in the Bible? Because I can't remember ever having read it. Yeah, I'll let you know. Several weeks went by, and I went to him, and I said, one Sunday morning, I said, you remember I asked you about that passage. Did you ever find it? He said, no. He said, I found this. And he read a New Testament passage of Scripture that talked in part of what he was quoting. And actually, what it turns out to be, and there is a part in the Old Testament over in Psalms, and I don't remember the exact Psalms, off the top of my head and then that connects in with a New Testament passage of scripture that if you take the last part of that psalm and you put it with it then you suddenly have this verse I'm sure that someone meaning to do right and good preached it somewhere along the line other people heard it and it's got picked up and I've heard it I heard it preached by a preacher just not very long ago and I, I can't help but sort of snicker every time I hear it because I know that's not what the scripture says see but I had a bigger issue with it that's not what the Bible says it's not what the Bible teaches now this will start to lead us I think in the direction of the stream again why is that important why does that even matter 
Well, let me tell you why. You see, Jesus gave us parables, and a lot of them. He spoke in parables to try to make it simpler for us to understand his message, which was so contrary to the message of the church, of the Pharisee. Jesus taught that there was a, I don't remember if it said he was a king, a rich ruler, a master. We'll just call him the master, who had a number of servants that worked for him. And when he came to collect his taxes, his part that was due to him, each one came and paid him rightfully, but one. And the one came to him, and he didn't have all that he owed him. And he, he didn't have it. And, and he began to plead with the master, Oh, master, I'm sorry, can you give me a little more time? I mean, come on, which am, who amongst us in our lifetime? If you've lived as old as I've lived and under as many hard times as I've been in and am I in now, trying to make it from month to month. You've had that time. You've had to go to somebody and say, I, 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 I don't know how I'm going to pay you everything that I owe you. Kind of felt like that last month. 400 and something dollars for propane gas. $300 in medicine. Where did that leave me any money to eat and pay rent? I still had a car payment to make and insurance payments to make. And, you know, you just sit there and you raise your hand to your head. Well, that's where he was at. And he was like, man, I, 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 I just don't know what I'm going to do. And the master looked at him and said, don't worry about it, son. You can just pay me next time I come through my, my fair school bit. It's forgiven. Don't worry about it. It's forgiven. See, that's what happens when we go to the altar and we come into the Lord. When we accept, which means to believe, we accept that Jesus is the Son of God, the promised Messiah. When we accept that, and we fall in love with God with all our heart, mind, and soul. When we have that intimate relationship with God, that means we start the seed of faith. And we grow in that love the more that we learn the Lord, the more that we learn what His Word teaches us. But at that moment that we go up and we accept that Jesus is the Son of God, we know that we must confess our sin to him. Why? If I brought up to you someone that you had great admiration for, but you had never met them, but just before he walked into the room with me, you had said loud enough, well, I think he must be a phony, a skunk, because he's never made it his choice to come meet me. And just at that moment, the door opens up and I walk in with him. And you're, he's looking right at you. Your face would immediately grow red and you would immediately say, I'm sorry, I did. I, I, I hope. You'd be hoping he didn't hear. When we suddenly accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, then we must confess that sin. And we must express that we love him and that we believe in him. And that he is Lord of our lords in our life. And when he does, he forgives us of all of our past sin. It is indeed wiped away. And according to the, to the psalm and according to what the New Testament combined teaches, indeed that past sin is removed. It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. But New Testament says it this way. It says you become a new creature. Old things pass away. And all things become new. Woo! Think about that. 
old things pass away. Doesn't say they still exist. They're not put in a little memory jar somewhere, in a memory book somewhere. They are passed away. And you begin anew. Because when you accept that, you're purified by the blood of Christ. You are sanctified. You are made holy. You are made as that newborn babe popping right out of the mama's womb. You are cleansed in and out. You don't know sin. And no sin stain is on you. Your soul has been baptized in the blood. And you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. The whole reason we get baptized is to do what? Paul explains it to us in great detail. We get baptized so that when we go under the water, we are testifying that we have been buried. Our sin, our carnal flesh, our carnal spirit, our carnal mind... Our carnal desires are buried with Christ. And when we rise up from that water, we've been resurrected with Christ. And are made alive. A new creature. Old things pass away. And all things become new. But you see, that man, he walked away from the master. While the master went back home over the next months, before he made his next trip there, this man went to everybody who owed him money. And he didn't forgive little Johnny for the three cows he owed him. He made him pay up. He didn't forget about the two bags of wheat that Mary Jane had bought on time. He collected it. And he went around collecting debts, and some he beat, some he had thrown in the debtor's prison because they owed him money. And when the master returned again a year later and he stood before the master, and it came his turn to pay up, the master looked at him, and he goes to handing him his money, and he said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said, last year you didn't have what was due me. No, no, Lord. But I got it this year. But last year you didn't have it, did you? No, no, I didn't. Did I not forgive you of that debt? Yes, Master, you did. Then why did you go and you beat your servants and you collected and you threw some in jail. He said, get away from me and cast me cast out into outer darkness. And not only this debt for this year, but the debt that you owed me from last year is due you. You become accountable for it all. So see, that's why when that scriptural combination of verses is used it's not correct because it gives the impression that no matter what you do once you've come to Jesus you can go on out there and you can beat you can rob you can steal you can lie and don't worry about it your debt's all being cast away and that's not what the scripture teaches so let's get back way to the beginning of this little video. About four and a half years ago, um, some of you have heard me talk about Josel in the past, and I will again. If you go down to my videos here on YouTube, and you will find that I've got some of her singing. When we first met, one of the things that she wanted to do was to begin to learn the Word of God. She had a sincere desire. I mean, I'm talking about, I wish there was five people in my life with the kind of desire that she has. 
she'd been reading books and she'd been listening and she'd been and I told her I said first thing we got to do is get you in the Bible and out of commentaries now listen folks everybody who knows me knows that I'm a King James only person for one major reason is because God is not the author of confusion and I believe that it's a stamp substantially the best that we have. And a, a friend, I mean, I call him a friend. He probably really doesn't know me from Adam, but he's got thousands of followers. He's a missionary. Did a, a video, and he, and he didn't mean any harm in his video, I assure you of that. Because I know he's a man of God, and I have great, great respect for him. But he keeps bringing out the historical things and, the, and why he thinks this version of the Bible was an improvement over the King James and that one's an improvement over the King James. Then he gets a lot of flack and then he says, why am I getting this flack? And I told him, I told him, I said, brother, I wouldn't do what you're doing for this reason. Because and I'm going to paraphrase my answer a little bit here, but because it's bringing confusion. People are already, the devil has been on the Bible for over a hundred years trying to disprove it, find fault with it, and make it right or wrong. And maybe what you think is historical fact, maybe your fact isn't as factual as you think your fact is, regardless of how much you think it's right. You know, I've never met anyone in my 69 years who says that they're standing on historical fact that doesn't believe what they're saying is historical fact. Then we find out their facts aren't right. See, here's the problem, just in a nutshell. We don't know of and don't think that there was any scriptural documentation written until roughly a hundred years after Christ that at least was ever found. And then we know that it probably wasn't written by in the original hand of Paul or Luke or Peter or whoever was the writer, that it was rewritten by scribe after scribe after scribe because the kind of parchments and materials they had to write on then wouldn't have lasted. I mean, come on. You go down to Walmart, you buy a dollar notebook, and you take it home and you write on it with ink. Go back and try to read that 20 years later, 50 years later. I've got, I've got stuff that my mom wrote when she was a, a girl that is so faded and the paper is so fragile, it wouldn't have lasted. So scribes rewrote, and then those get passed on. And by the time that King James authorized his version of the Bible, we know, and I'm not going to pull the chart out here again right now because I've done it on past videos, but there is a number of other books that had already been wrote. The King James was not the first English version of the Bible. There was a couple before that that was wrote in English. One of them that was accepted as the leading Bible for years. I've seen comparisons. I've done comparisons. I've owned some rare Bibles in my time. I no longer do. Uh, I gave them away. But I did have at one time. And I've done comparisons. I spent hours. And I listened to a, a guy on TikTok who buys rare books, and he has a first edition King James, and he compared the John 3.16 to five previous versions, and he got all the way back, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, it was the Bishop's Bible that was the most accurate compared to the King James. Then he compared it to newer versions and boy, they took it all over the place. They weren't close to any of the original ones. Here's the problem, too. Much of the documentation that was used by King James and by the Catholic Church to do the Dewey Rhyme 
they had a lot of the same documentation available to them. King James is reportedly to have even had more available to him than the Catholic priest did it doing the Dewey Rhyme. And two different groups of people authorized by two different leaders, one being the Catholic Church, the Pope, the other being uh, a carnal and earthly king. And they had access to documents and scrolls and original scribes' writings that have long been out of existence. And though you might find something that you think was similar to what they had, you weren't there. I wasn't there. None of us was there. And not the most knowledgeable or the best scholar alive was there. And cannot testify one-on-one -on -one that this is the very document that Peter wrote, or Paul wrote, or James wrote. You might not like me putting it this way, but this is the truth. And then, even if we had that exact document written in a language and in a style of language that we have scholars today who will tell you they don't fully understand some of the old Armanic and, and some of the oldest Hebrew writing and some of the earliest Greek writing in its entirety, they have an ideal. But see, here's the problem. Every village, every city, every culture, even those that spoke the same language, whether they spoke Greek or they spoke Hebrew or they spoke Latin, whatever the language was that they were speaking, there is a different dialect and a different way things are meant no matter where you're at. So, for example, I'll just give this as an example. You tell me that your Aunt Mary is sick, and I say, oh my goodness, bless her heart, let's have prayer for her. And you say, oh, he's, he means it in a loving and tender way that God would touch her heart. Bless means to make happy, would make her heart happy. And he's going to have prayer with her, and you'd love it. However, if you were down south in parts of down south, like down yonder in Arkansas way or down going a little bit farther down the Alabama way and you get talking to, to friends and family and relatives I got down yonder when they say bless your heart they don't mean it in a wonderful little way that make their heart happy what they're saying well bless her little heart bless his little heart it's a sarcastic statement that means, who cares? I don't care. Sometimes used to make fun. Living right here in the city of St. Louis, if I go over to the north side of the city, in fact, I don't have to go to the north side anymore because the north side has moved to the south side. You know, like the Jeffersons moving on up. Well, it's certainly moved on up over the years, and that's a good thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what I'm going to say to you is I lived 21 years in the apartment complex, the same apartment complex in South St. Louis. And in that 21 years, I watched it go from 80% white to 90% black. Now, I'm not saying anything against black people, so don't go going down that road either. I got three grandchildren who are black, so don't go down that road with me either. What I'm saying is, though, that their expression of words and the way they put them together, they can say the exact same thing I just said, and it don't come out sounding nothing like what I just said. Used to have a neighbor below me, 
well-educated black man, very, very well-educated black man, had a white wife, two little children, very, very nice family, liked them a lot. When I'd go down to talk to him, I mean, everything was right there. We could have this conversation. He was, he was far better educated than I am. I'll tell you that. My education's not sloppy, but his was a far a lot better educated than I was. But the minute that some of his family would come over, I was there one night when some of his brothers come over. It was like you flipped a light switch, man. He was talking. I didn't, I couldn't understand nothing hardly he was saying. And I had to say to him, wait, 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 what'd you just say? <laughs> you know, come on, man. Get it back down here. Get it real where I can understand it. So we wouldn't understand the various dialects and meanings sometimes implied there. And then my biggest thing is, if you take the original Dewey rhyme and the original King James and you put them side by side, you'll find there's very little difference. Very little difference in the translation of the books and scrolls that they interpreted. Oh, there might be a different thee and a different thou, and they might sometimes uh, state a word, a phrase, just a hair bit different, but the meanings come out to be the same. So that says to me that the King James translation was pretty good. It also says that the Dewey Rhyme original translation was pretty good. And then if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty, some of these verses that they say, well, they were added by the translators. Huh. Huh. You know why I say huh? Because the Dewey Rhyme translators was using a totally different group of people who wouldn't even talk to the people doing it for King James. And they have the same verse in their translation as is in the King James translation. Oh my. Huh. But we think we get smarter in time and we change things and we, we want to prove that this one's wrong and that one's right and this one's wrong and that one's right. And here's all I'm going to say is what we've done is we've caused people to lose faith and trust in the very word of God that we believe in. You go to church, you don't know what they're going to be preaching from. Everybody wanting to prove they're smarter than somebody else and they have to be more right because we found something else now that we think disproves everything that we thought we knew. And that adds confusion and it adds doubt. Because let me tell you how I see it, you see. You might not agree with me, but I'm going to tell you how I see it. I go to your, your car lot. And you're selling Fords. And I walk up and I see this beautiful little 63 Ford Falcon. I like that one because I had one when I was a senior in high school. And I walk over to you and I say, is that car any good? And you say, yeah, you know, it's kind of okay. But sitting over here... I have a car I think you'll like better because I've got a 65 Galaxy 500 sitting here. It's got a much bigger engine. And you know what? I get in that 65 Galaxy 500 and I drive it around a little bit. And let me tell you a little problem they had with the 64, 65 Galaxy 500s. When you go over the low spot in the road, like if you lived out in the country, the oil pan would tend to drag because the engine sets so low, that oil pan hit rocks. I know, been down that road too. But that little Falcon set higher. The oil pan wasn't setting down so low that it was hitting against rocks. 
And maybe I get in that Ford and I drive it around a couple of blocks and I hear a little ping in the engine that just doesn't sound just right. I go back and I say, no, let me, let me drive the Falcon. I drive that little Falcon with that little bitty V8. I don't remember the size of it anymore. It was a little bitty V8. Get that thing, whew, man, that thing will run. <laughs> It'll run to at least a hundred and a couple of miles an hour above that. And that's about as fast as you're going to get her to go. But she'll run. Then I come back and I say, I'm going to take the Falcon. And you keep trying to tell me that the Ford is better. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to walk away from your lot and I'm not going to buy either car from you because I don't trust you anymore. And see, what we have managed to do is cause people not to trust our Bible anymore. Not to trust the Word of God anymore. And we have nothing but doubt and gainsayers and passages left out and words twisted in the meanings they don't mean. And we say, oh, that's okay. That's okay. No, it's not okay. Let me tell you something. If the King James Bible led me wrong in one thing, then I'd be done with it in its entirety. But let me tell you what it hasn't done in 55 years of preaching. In my 69 years of life, it's never misled me on anything or took me down any wrong road. So now I'm going to go back to my favorite Bible student, Joselle. One of the first things I did is I packaged up, and boy, this cost me a lot more money than the Bible cost. But I packaged up my King James Thompson chain. I like Thompson chain because it's not full of commentary. It's just a lot of reference material. If you like references, and you want to draw your own conclusions like me, that's the book. You want to know something else? I like mysteries. I like books where I have to dig and try to find the solution and look for the mysteries. Somebody on a project one time, we were staying in a crummy hotel. It was a crummy hotel. And the architect that was with us came down to my room one night and he knocked on my door and he said, Hey, Rich, he says, I got this book. He says, I've been reading it. It's called Sutter's Island. He said, I want you to read it and see if you can figure out the ending on this thing. And if you do, explain it to me. He's still a friend of mine, by the way. Many, many years later, he's still a friend of mine. And he said, if you figure that out, you let me know. Well, I read the book. Next trip out to the project, he and I went out to supper one night. And I said, you know, I think I've got the ending figured out. But I'll be, tell you right up front, I'm not quite sure. See, a lot of you think you've got the ending of the Bible figured out. But you ought, to, you ought to back away and admit you ain't got it quite right yet. You ain't quite sure. You'd be a lot wiser. There's nothing worse than a man who, thinking themselves to be wise, become fools. As Paul says, because you see that preacher who got up and did all that blood moon stuff? I don't want to listen to nothing he's got to say anymore. He proved himself not to be a prophet of God. That woman, though I had listened to her a number of times on TikTok, as she gave her end time philosophies. I don't want to hear anything she says. Because she's already proved she's not a prophet of God. The prophet, by the way, prophecy in the New Testament means rightly dividing the word of truth. The prophecy has been given to us. And that we now have the ability to understand it and interpret it correctly. Which takes, oh, that other little gift, discernment. But anyway, so I packaged up my Thompson chain and I sent it to her. Hmm. During the pandemic, that same Bible was selling for over $700 on Amazon. Now they're back. You can get them again at $39, $40. And if you get one of the ones with the really good leather like that one was, you'll be back up to about $200. But at that point, time when I bought it, I paid $150, I think it was, for it. But it cost me another $150 to ship it to the Philippines. But she got it, and she was so excited. She started studying immediately. 
after a little while, she said, I understand why you don't want me using these other books. Because they just don't say the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. Now, let me warn you about something that many people are very ignorant of. Most Filipinos, especially in this modern age, are very well educated. There are very few of them who do not go to college. And they don't go, you might think that because it's a third world country, they've got crummy colleges. I got news for you. They've got some very, very good colleges. And she went to one of the best ones in Manila and has a very substantial degree and is an extremely smart young lady right to start with. But she renewed her heart with God. And she began to really get involved in studying the Word of God. And after, oh, maybe four or five months of us studying, she said to me one day, she says, I got a question. She said, my favorite story in the Bible is I think everything has to go back to the beginning. It has to go back to the beginning. So you've got to go to the creation, to Adam and Eve. I said, yeah, I agree with that. It all does. When you read the Bible, if you don't understand this, then you're never going to understand anything you're reading in the Bible. It starts, and it is a will that goes all the way back around to the beginning. It makes a perfect loop, a circle. And if you don't get that, you've got a lot of studying more to do. Let me tell you, the first thing she said to me is, I've been studying about Adam and Eve, and we were discussing various parts of it. And then she said to me, what was the fruit that Satan caused Eve to eat, talked her into eating? He didn't cause her to, by the way. She made that choice. Satan is not guilty of doing anything, but what Satan does the best, lies. That's why Jesus called him the father of lies. And all who lie, he calls them his sons and daughters. Because he said, you're a liar after your father of lies, Satan. I said, well, he told them not to eat of the tree of life nor the tree of knowledge she said but what fruit did they actually eat well I said of knowledge I said you know people think it was an apple some people argue it was an orange some people a persimmon there's been all kinds of things she said no no what was the actual fruit now I've studied and preached on this thought about it a million times and then she said it was the lie they ate the lie that they could eat of that fruit and they'd never die oh glory to God that was so it hit me right smack between the eyes and I knew as soon as it came out of her mouth she had taught me something that if I ever knew it, I'd forgotten it. But it woke me up in that moment. Because that's exactly, and that's exactly the beginning of the circle. It just goes around and around. Who was that group that sung that song? Find a wheel, and it goes round, 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 as it spins along with a happy sound. You remember that song? Anyway. That wheel started spinning right there. And do you know that is the exact same lie that has been preached? See? The devil told Lot's wife that. Oh, you can look back at something to my It's not going to hurt you. She turned into a pillow of stone. Now, maybe the Bible doesn't say Satan was standing there saying it out loud to her. But he was saying it to her in her heart and her head. And in her ears, her inner ear heard it. And she turned around and she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. 
just as God said to happen. See, when that crazy old preacher Noah, that righteous man, got up to preach and teach and tell people that they needed to, to obey God and get their heart rights with God, they laughed at him and they scoffed. And when Noah said the world is going to be flooded, that, that God's going to destroy the world with water, they didn't believe it. They believed the lie that Satan said. Thou shalt surely not die. Come on, you're not going to die. Man, that lie has been told throughout history. He's like a vacuum cleaner salesman. Satan is like the vacuum cleaner salesman that never dies and never stops selling the same vacuum throughout history. Man, he's still carrying his Kirby door to door, and he was carrying his Kirby before there was electricity. Just kidding about Kirby. Kirby, don't sue me now. You're a good vacuum cleaner. But Satan has been selling you the same lie. You can sin, and you shall surely not die. You're not going to die. We have a whole denomination who carries that as their, with pride, their theology, their religious theory, that you can sin once you become a Christian, but don't worry, you ain't going to die You'll just lose your rewards. But you ain't going to die. Your soul will be saved. Because you said, I believe in Jesus. That's the same old lie that Satan told Adam and Eve. That's the same reason that judgment begins at the house of God. That's the same reason that you don't get to eat of the tree of life until you pass through judgment and see that kingdom of heaven. I said it's all rotation, a circle that brings us back. What is the kingdom of heaven for you and I but the Garden of Eden without any sin? Now, we can argue all day on the theology of, of once saved, always saved. One of my best friends in the whole world, he's my dearest friend. He didn't start out this way, but he had an uncle who was a preacher who kind of got pointing him off into once saved, always saved theology and he went and he bought that set of commentaries by McGee. I can't think of McGee's first name. But McGee is a far ringer, winger on the, on the once saved, always saved thing. And he, he says some good things in his commentaries. But he's, he's also, you got to understand he's wrong on some things. I never could understand... This always bothered me when I was a young preacher starting out. How you can tell me that Calvin is absolutely right in all that he says, but Wesley, both Wesley brothers, Charles and I believe the other one was John, wasn't it? Are both just totally wrong in what they're teaching. And then you turn around and you say, but no, no, no. Calvin was wrong, and Wesley was wrong. Luther is the guy who was right. And then you come down, and then there was there was Bynum, and there was there was this whole list of people that I can't even remember all their names. Then you get into the more famous preachers like Spurgeon, and you get into uh, various ones of them all along the way. And I'm going to tell you. I don't care. I think Calvin had his good points. I think Wesley's had their good points. I think they were right in some areas, wrong in others. 
The Armenians were right in some areas and wrong in others. Luther was right in some. But you know what? They were all arguing the scripture as they were being introduced to it from the first time. And they faced the same problem that the Jews faced. You need to understand that about those guys. You see, the Jews had tradition. Lots of years of tradition. Lots of years of tradition. They had the law. They had various kings. They had various prophets. They had high priest after high priest. And they had this interpretation and that interpretation and this translation and that translation. And the law changed according to however the high priest decided that it would change. That reminds me of that other church, you know, that big church that claims to be built on the only true apostle, Peter, and and they set themselves up a man who is supposed to be incarnate next to God himself. And they put a name on it called Pope. Yeah, right. Look, if, if you want to believe their faith and their doctrine, go right ahead. You're not going to... I mean, I think there are some true God-fearing and loving people within that denomination, but I'm going to tell you something. You might want to stand back a little and compare what the Bible says, for there is only one mediator between man and God, and that is Christ Jesus. And you want to know what's even more funny? It's in their Bible, too. It's in their... You go back to that original Dewey Ron first edition, it's right there. It's there. It's there. You want to have fun? If you really learn the scripture well, sit down with the Catholic priest and start start running the scripture through him in a debate and watch the sweat start breaking out on their forehead and excuses to why they're not going to talk to you any longer. Now, I used to do that when I was young. I don't do that anymore because I don't believe it's profitable. But I did it with priests who were friends of mine so that I could learn their reasoning, their logic behind some of the stuff that they come up with. And I do have a pretty fair understanding. I read some pretty in-depth documents in their faith. But I, I wanted to understand the Calvinist doctrine as well. But Calvin's doctrine doesn't line up with the Bible. But see, I understand. Calvin was fighting, making a pull from the Catholic Church, a church that held power and authority. His argument wasn't so much to say the Bible was an absolute correct, this is the way it is. His argument was, I am proving you, Catholic Church, that you're wrong. That's the same thing Luther was going through. I'm arguing with you, Catholic Church, that you were wrong. That's the same thing that the Wesleyans was going through. That's the same thing that the early Armenians was going through. And the Greek Orthodox was going through. See, everybody was trying to prove the other one wrong. And what I'm trying to say to you is we don't need to prove anybody wrong. I've cut the Word of God. I believe it. I accept it. The Bible says the scripture is of no private interpretation. It's not for me to prove you wrong. I'll give you my ideal, my understanding, my theology, but I'm not here to prove you wrong. I'll show you why I think certain theology, certain theory, religious theory is theology. Why much of it is wrong. when we're doing these devotionals and studies. But I do that to help you. Prove, prove whether I'm right or they're right. I want you, I challenge you to search the scripture. So now that we've walked all that distance, let's get back to what I started all of this about. In 1 Thessalonians 4.1, actually I think I just quoted that wrong, 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Hmm. Thought the rapture people said it was happening and nobody was going to know what's going on and people were just going to be taken left and right and woof, 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 woof. That ain't what it says here. 
says he's coming as a thief in the night, as a woman brings birth to a child. She doesn't know the pain that she's going to go through. We studied today, we studied today that the tribulations that's going on around us, the earthquakes, the, the bad weather and all those things go right back to that same old scripture. You know, if you, my people which are called by my name would humble themselves. For what the Bible tells us clearly are in Luke, I believe it was Luke verse, uh, chapter 21, where Luke said that these things are the vengeance of God against the ungodly. So for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with that voice of the archangel, with the voice of the archangel. He's going to sound. He's going to speak. Just as the archangel Michael spoke. And why would I say that Michael? Because it was Michael in the war in heaven that laid hold of Satan and cast Satan out of heaven. God, Jesus sent him, cast him out, but the archangel took him, held him captive. It was an angel that defeated him. And that same voice of that same angel is going to announce now the coming of Christ with the trump of God. Man, we know trumpets have always played a part. Huh. They marched around the walls of Jericho. Seven times they marched around And the walls came tumbling down And the walls came tumbling down God told Joshua to go to Jericho And to march seven times around See, on that seventh time they let out a shout And they blew their horns, their trumpets and the walls came down. So we now again see the trump of God. And listen to this. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Ooh, wait a minute. Dead in Christ shall rise first. Now. Because we're doing this on the fly and I don't have these things wrote down, we will look them up as they come to me. And we know that Peter says that judgment begins where? Well, it would help if I could see what I'm typing so that I could spell this correctly. So let's just do this a different way. And let's see. I am not, I am not seeing well enough to. <coughs> this, this is so small for me since I've had the eye surgery and, uh, oh, that's why I typed the wrong letter. go to the right book here. Let's see. 
ungodly. In Second Peter 3, 7, he says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of men. Now, I want one more word in here again. In my old days, I could have told you right by heart exactly where the scripture is, but um, He tells us that the unjust is reserved unto the day of judgment. Here we go. I knew I'd find it. Just takes me a while sometimes. First Peter four seventeen. For the time is come. The judgment must begin at the house of God. And if first begin at us, then what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Oh, wow. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Oh, my. See, we, we rephrase that. We paraphrase that. Most preachers, we, we leave out a lot of this because if we tried to say this all together, we'd never remember it correct anyway. But we shortened it to say, if judgment first begin at the house of God, then where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? And that's, that's exactly what Peter is telling us here. Judgment begins with the house of God. So it bothered me when I would read this. For then he says, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? Now, we, we're taught that the ungodly are dead in their trespasses while they're yet in their trespasses. Let's talk about that word dead for a minute. What does that mean? Dead means that there is no life. There is no life. Now, we know when we studied uh, back in our devotionals on John, we know that there were some interesting statements that was made about life. Let me see if I can quickly... Find the one that I'm thinking of. I believe this is it. In 1 John 1 1, that which was from the beginning, that which was from the beginning, we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. So see, why is this Bible important to me and why do I not like to see it be distorted, argued about, debated, and people confused about it? It's because it's the word of life. Jesus said I that these scriptures were given by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to holy men to write them down. Jesus said, I am the word. 
the way and the truth and the life. So see, the word of life, if I understand Jesus, but what method do I have to understand Jesus? Prayer, faith, love, and his word. And uh, let's see. There's another passage that I want to get to here. And this is the promise, 1 John 2.25. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Now, I saw a sister the other day do a long devotional telling you why eternal doesn't mean what we think it means. And I went back and I, I told her, I said, your point is very good that there are many different ways to define the word eternal. But the reason we accept it as we do, and I gave her the passage of scripture, for the Bible says that we will live forever and ever. That's eternal. Forever and ever. That's eternal. And John, 1 John 3.14 says, For we know that we have passed from death into life because we, listen to this, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whoa, whoa, there now. Now we're starting to get somewhere here. See? The dead in Christ shall rise first. But who is the dead in Christ? He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And 1 John 5, 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us. Eternal, forever and ever, life. And this life is in his Son. So you can't have it without having Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus said, I and you and you and me. John says, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So wait a minute. I and you and you and me. That's what Jesus said. Paul said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Peter taught us when we're covering the devotionals there, have the mind of Christ. Oh, my. And we can go on. But then this video is going to be so long, I won't be able to post it. The point that I'm trying to make here is, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, which is Christ, the Comforter, then you don't have life. So, if judgment begins at the house of God, why did he define Sinner and ungodly together. Why didn't he say the church begins at the house, judgment begins at the house of God with the sinners and then the ungodly? Well, Revelations tells us that sin and death, along with those that commit abominations and liars and drunkards and thieves and whoremongers, will all be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. <coughs> So, we are, we are getting into a much deeper subject. The dead in Christ shall rise first. But now let's look at something else. There is another thing that we need to review. And I am going to tell you now. Those of you who like to find the truth and, and really, uh, really study it out, you want to do this. 
you want to do a search on death. <coughs> Not death per se as much as dead. And find the ways that it's used. And you're going to find some interesting passages. Let me just do this verbally. Asleep in Christ. And even then, it didn't write it the way I said. Asleep in Christ is found one time in the scripture as well. Oh, no wonder it didn't find it. <laughs> <coughs> I had a filter on. 1 Corinthians 15, 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable. But now in Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. See Paul was telling us there's a difference between being dead in Christ and asleep in Christ. Remember what I told you dead means? Dead means without life. When you go to the story of Stephen, who was stoned, we always use the word a stoned to death. And he was in the carnal, the carnal flesh. Yeah, it, it perished. <coughs> <coughs> but go look it up in Acts and it tells you and then he fell asleep he went asleep when we go all the way back in the Old Testament we go to when uh, King Saul had Samuel brought awoken from the dead it said Saul wanted to know why I mean Samuel wanted to know from Saul, why did you disturb my slumber? Why did you bother me while I was asleep? Go to the story. The shortest verse in the Bible for you trivia bugs is Jesus wept over in John. Go to that story and read that whole story. Here, Jesus was talking to the crowd of people. He was talking particularly Martha was there present with him. And he was teaching, if, if you believe in me, then I will give you life. And I will come again to receive you and raise you from the dust of the earth. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Martha, oh, she heard that. She believed it. But then as they got near home, Mary and many of the Jews came to meet Jesus to tell him that Lazarus had, had died. He was dead. And Jesus cried. He cried. He wept. Why do you think he wept? He goes on down, and I'll paraphrase here. You can go look the story up. But I'll paraphrase a little bit. He kind of scolded them. He said, especially Martha. Didn't you just tell me you believe that I will bring back to life those that are asleep? Those they, they, You see, when you, your heart is right with God, you've passed from death into life through Christ Jesus by faith. We haven't received the fruit of the tree of life until we make it into his kingdom. First, we have to make it through judgment. But the beauty of it is, is we just go to sleep. We just go to sleep. One of the 
things that really sprung out at me is this as well. When you go to um, the book of Jude, there's an expression. The first time I saw this, I was dumbfounded by it. Because I thought, what in the world does he mean? Let's go read it together. So, for us to get this, we need to back up just a hair bit. In Jude, he says, verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Whoa, maybe we better back up. Who are they who have gone in the way of Cain? Well, see, we got to really back up a little bit here. Um, kind of fun, because this reminds me of what I was talking to you about a while ago, about the archangel, Christ returns with the voice of the archangel. It was Michael, the archangel, whom contended with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. See, that's all he had to do to defeat the devil, is the Lord rebuke thee. Is this the devil and he'll flee from you? Draw unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you. Rebuke the devil in the name of the Lord. But these speak, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. See, a lot of people talk about a lot of things and they talk like they know the Bible and they talk like they know they know exactly what the Word of God says. What they've learned is what they learned through some commentary. What they've learned, they've learned from some seminary. What they've learned in some Bible college. What they've learned in some book written by somebody else. We have to learn from the Holy Spirit direct. Jesus said, I go away, I'll send a comforter unto you who will teach you all things. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran speedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. And let me tell you something. You get off, you want to argue your theologies and you want to have fun with that, you go have fun with it. But you're getting away from the things of the Word of God to argue your viewpoint. And you twist the word of God to make your viewpoint correct. And I don't want to do that. I want to give you my ideal as, as it struck me by the Holy Spirit. And then if the Holy Spirit confirms this in you, then you know it's true. And if it doesn't confirm it in you, it doesn't mean that it was a lie in me. It means that God was speaking to me to see something I need it to see. But see, I think this is for, we all need to see it. Or I wouldn't be wasting my time sharing it. In verse 12, he goes on, and this is a long verse. He says, they are spots in your feast of charity. In other words, they are, man, you put a gainsayer in, you put somebody in a room teaching a false doctrine, you bring somebody in your Sunday school class who's wanting to teach, oh, that's okay to sin, you shall not die. It's okay to have a little social drink, you shall not die. It's okay if you use curse words that go against the witness of Christ, thou shall not surely die. It's okay if you have an affair, you won't die. It's okay if you tell a little lie, you're not going to die. 
how they'd like to dismiss Ezekiel, who said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. He says that twice. Twice. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Paul says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You get those people in there wanting to argue this other baloney with you? And I'll tell you, unless you're really one of those people who like to argue, and you're not arguing to win because you ain't going to win, leave it go. Present your point of truth so that the rest of the class can hear it. And then while they're getting angry, a little hot under the collar, just be silent. You've showed them the truth. Let it go. Feeding themselves without fear. I tell you, I'd be a little afraid if I was basing my theology with Christ on Calvin. I would. I'd be, I'd be greatly afraid of that. Because there's an awful lot of things that he got wrong. Not only once saved, always saved is a bunch of hula. I can tell you, if you think predestination is the thing, then you haven't studied the scripture very well. And if you are one of those people who says, but God has never changed his mind. He is always the same. You're another person that ain't changed that hasn't studied the Bible very much. I did a Bible study the other night, again with my friend in the Philippines, and we got off on this subject. Huh. I quickly found 11 times that it either repented God or God changed his mind. Flat out says that he did. Well, that throws away your theory of he knows everything and how it's going to play out, and it's going to play out just as he's got it planned, and that's the end of the song. Nope. It's not what the Bible teaches at all. That's what you teach. That's what your theology has taught you. It's not what the Scripture taught you. You need to go back to the Bible a little bit. So they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. In other words, meaning... They don't have the Holy Spirit. Another way to say that, there are those five virgins that had lamps. Oh, they were clean. Well, they were holy. They waved their little Bible around. But they didn't have oil. Clouds without water. Lamps without oil. Carried about of the winds. Trees whose fruit weathereth without fruit. Wait a minute. Trees without fruit. First of all, some of them are trees without fruit. Withered. The tree itself is drying up. It can't produce fruit because it's not living a holy life. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see a tree branch that's dead and it's withered, and I look at the tree, if the tree isn't already dead, it's dying. It's dying. Without fruit. Without fruit. Now get ready. Twice dead. Plucked up by the roots. Twice dead. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we've seen Paul said those that are asleep in Christ will not perish. They're going to live forever. They're going to be there. They're going to be in the church. Judgment first begins at the house of God. And then we go to that story that so many people like to talk about, but they really don't like to put it all in the context. They don't like to really get down and dig into it a little bit. You know, about the the sheep and the goat, the separation on the on the right side. He separates those who were faithful and did good, and, and they're called the just, and they're welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. 
and then the goats is pushed over to the left, and they they make all kinds of statements about the wonderful things that they have done. And he said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Key word, knew, knew, knew. Knew meant to have an intimate relationship with God. But how did they get together in the first place to be judged? Because judgment first begins at the house of God with the sinner, the twice dead, the dead in Christ. If all that rose to stand before God was lifted up and to the clouds to meet him in the air, as he descends with the saints that are gone before us, and he brings them with him, and we're going to rise to meet him, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. If it was just all saints of God already known that we're saints of God because our name's in the Lamb's book of life. So we're being the roll call. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise. I know that's not Bible, but it's a song that somebody wrote filled with the Spirit. Man, if our name is on the Lamb's book of life, we're already rising. We're going to meet him in the air. If that was the end of the song and the dance, man, the gates would be swung wide open. <coughs> our loved ones would be there to greet us. We'd walk right up to the tree of life and take a bite of that fruit. Whatever that fruit is, we'd have a bite of it. I'll tell you what the bite of that is. The fruit of life, Jesus told us, God is the light. Jesus is life. Jesus said the word is life. And we'd go up there and we'll embrace it and we'll have it eternal forever and ever. But you see, the problem is there's a lot of people who got their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But they're dead in Christ. They're not asleep in Christ. Sleep in Christ is when a person who is sanctified, holy, blameless, righteous, a perfect heart, a heart that is right with God, passes from this life in the physical, his physical body decays and goes back to the dust from whence it came. But his soul is live evermore. It's just asleep. It's resting. I'm resting in the promises. See, resting. And those of us that are asleep, those that remain will be called up to rise, to stand before judgment. And the dead in Christ. Now, it's interesting. When you go into Revelations and you read the book, and it says he looks into the Lamb's Book of Life. Then it says he opens the other books. And there's where the judgment takes place. I like to call them the books of judgment. I don't think the Bible ever specifically calls them by that. But I like to call them that. Um, there's a song, God Keeps a Record. It's that record book. So why does the dead in Christ rise first? Well, it's pretty easy for God setting up above. <laughs> if you've ever been down on a farm, do you know, do you know if you're riding a horse down a gravel road and, and there's some cows over in the field and you're on a stallion, the stallion will start getting excited and start trying to pull off the road and go over to that. And you're like, get back over here, dummy. That's cows. It's not mares. It's cows. You ever been out in a mix of a herd of sheep that have some goats scattered in there with it? I have. It's pretty doggone hard to tell the goat from the sheep. They look pretty near the same. They got the same fuzz. They get the same little... You know, horns coming up, and I mean, it's pretty hard to tell them a difference. 
But God, where God's coming down, sending his son, coming down, descending from heaven to gather us, he can see the goats and the sheep. See, he can tell. My mama hated me when I was out farming, helping her in the garden. I couldn't tell. I'll blame it on my eyes. Maybe it's just my bad sense. I don't know which it was. But I'd be out there hoeing weeds, going 90 to nothing, thinking I'm doing a good job. And she'd come out there and whop me upside the head and say, you're cutting down the vegetable plants. Cut the weeds, not the vegetable plants. I couldn't tell no difference. See, a lot of you, you can't tell the difference. But God knows the difference. He knows whose hearts are right with him, who's alive with him. And he knows those that have fallen asleep in this world who have gone on to be with him. But the dead, the goat, those that do not have that intimate relationship, those who are twice dead, those that are trees that have weathered and their fruit weathered with them. And they started out, see, they started out in the race. They started out being a tree. They started out having good fruit. And it all went away because they listened to the salesman, the devil, when he knocked on their door. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Peter, Satan desires to have thee. Simon, Satan desires to have thee. Satan desires to have you. Satan's desire is to kill your spirit with God. To take it away. And the way he does that is by deceit, by lies. And if he can get you believing some false doctrine, woo, he jumps up and down with joy. Got me another one of them sheep. Breed it with a goat. Because when you breed a sheep with a goat, you give another goat. And then we have churches that's had false doctrine and false religion that's been out there for decades. And I'm telling you what, maybe they started with some fine sheep in the mix, but they started interbreeding. And now all they got is a bunch of goats. We need to be careful that we are not dead in Christ, but alive in Christ. That we are not yet asleep. So if we're not asleep, then we either have to be dead, or if we're starting to drift into that sleep, getting into that place where we're not paying any attention like they did at the garden, when they were supposed to be waiting on Jesus to come instead of watching, they fell, they fell asleep. Maybe you've gotten to that place, then you better wake up while you've got breath in your vessel. Because the dead in Christ, those people who were once on fire, virgins, holy with burning lamps, the goats, man, they're rising right there first. You know... <laughs> Oh, uh, my. You ever make a pot of soup and you're using a real oily meat in it and you look at the top as the soup is starting to get done and you see this layer of little thick bubbly stuff? You scoop that off because that's the grease and you don't want all that grease. That's the grease. Now, there's another trick they say that works. Like if you're making the chili and you've browned your meat in the same pan and you don't drain it and you put your 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 tomatoes and all that stuff in there and you get that chili grease up at the top. They say if you'll take a big spoon and put some cubes of ice in it and just float that around, float that around in that chili for a little bit, all that grease will stick right to the bottom of that spoon. Then you can just peel it right off. I don't know. I haven't tried it, but... 
So they say. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. You don't need to believe what I say. I ask you to believe what the Bible says. I believe you to search the scripture. And I believe that you need to find men and women of God who preach the truth. Now, that's not to say we're never going to call a name wrong or make some foolish mistake in our human flesh of, of old age, especially. It happens. But I can tell you this. This word of God has never failed me. And then I'm going to close with this thought. Why did this become important to me? Important enough for me to set up half the night when I probably should be sleeping. I've been sick. Feels like COVID, but I don't think it's COVID because I tested negative. But it's the way I felt when I got COVID. Except my mind is still working. Why, why did I set up to share this with you? When I was doing my devotional this morning, and I hit the end, and I was reading that last passage of Scripture, it's like somebody slapped me on the side of the face. See, that's the way the Holy Spirit works sometimes within me. I'm a little hard-headed, if you haven't noticed that. I am. It's not easy to get me going down a different road if I'm sure that I'm on the right road. Sometimes what we're sure of isn't always right. And I always remind myself of that scripture, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Thinking themselves to be wise, they become fools. I remind myself of those two passages often because I must be right because you're counting on me to teach you the gospel and the gospel isn't just the good news it's the absolute truth of the good news all of a sudden it just hit me and I sort of stumbled in the explanation my time was running out and here I am and it hit me as clear the dead in Christ and those asleep in Christ is two totally different things not the same at all so then I got with the most knowledgeable and my favorite Bible student and we talked about it a little bit this evening as well without me telling my conclusion threw it on the table and got her thoughts and we looked at it and we started looking in the scripture to verify could I be wrong could we be misunderstanding it is, is it something else God was trying to draw my attention to and then I'm like when I saw this in Jude years ago that leaped out at me Woo, that leaped out at me. I mean, like my, like my soul was on fire the first time I read it. I understood. I understood why Peter said that they, like pigs that have been washed, return to the mire. I understood what it meant in Hebrews when it said, He that willfully sins, who willfully sins, has crucified Christ in the flesh again and there is no more remission for sin I understand what it means when it says a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a sin that cannot be forgiven you because you're dead in Christ all of a sudden it's like how many times have I read, preached that passage of Scripture without joining it to the one in 1 Corinthians? How many times have I, have I seen that and it didn't leap off the page at me? Who 
Woo, there is a big difference and a significant lesson. Improving the devil to be a liar. And that's the grist of it. God bless you. Good night.